During the American Civil War, the city of Savannah was an extremely vital railway hub and a seaport. And guarding the city of Savannah was a series of fortifications, two of which are Fort Jackson and Fort Pulaski, which is near the city of Savannah. And today, we're visiting the third fort of that system called Fort McAllister. Fort McAllister would actually see a lot of action. Um, early in the war, uh, the Union Navy used it as a testing ground. When they were building monitors and using uh, new rifled cannons, they'd come to Fort McAllister and bombard them um, just to see the uh, capabilities of their new ships they were producing. And also, several Navy engagements happened in this body of water that resulted in the sinking of the CSS Nashville. So. Fort McAllister was the southernmost fort uh, guarding Savannah, and it was one of three forts that would guard Savannah. The other two were Fort Pulaski, and the other one was Fort Jackson. Now again, this is the southernmost uh, fort protecting Savannah, and Savannah was one of the most important ports in the Confederacy. So obviously where there's water, there is going to be naval battles, and this wreckage you see before us is from the CSS Nashville. And the CSS Nashville was a blockade runner, and it was renamed the Rattlesnake, and it was destroyed by the uh, Union Monitor Montauk on February 28, 1863, uh, after it went aground in the sandbar. Um, the fort was firing on the Monitor, and the Monitor was concentrating on the CSS Nashville. And the wreck is approximately 1,200 yards to the water that way. So in 1960, uh, these portions of uh, rotating machinery were excavated from the water there and they're on display here. How cool is that? These things are massive. Wow. And this is just giving a brief history of the uh, CSS Nashville. And it uh, entered Charleston Harbor on April 12, 1861, as the Civil War began. And uh, she was purchased in the uh, newly formed Confederate States Navy for a hundred grand. Huh. And the first vessel commissioned by the Confederate States government, and the first to fly a Confederate flag in England. That's interesting. And again, here's some of the machinery here that they uncovered in the 1960s. Now, I couldn't begin to tell you. Uh, what it did or what its purpose was. And I'm assuming it had to uh, have something to do with the vessel moving. I know it's difficult to see the sheer size of these things, but let's give it for some perspective. There's my foot, and there's this giant piece of machinery. Super cool. Before we make our way out to the fort, I was told by the uh, gentleman working the front desk that they have an amazing museum inside, and we're going to check it out and see what they have. Now, one of my favorite things about the American Civil War is the number of arms that were used. Now, traditionally, you think of this guy, the muzzle-loading Springfield or Enfield, depending on what side you're on. But you can see all the different variations of rifles that they had. And this one up top is a breech loader, so it'd be loaded from right here. And this one, the Spencer carbine, as you can see right here, and the bullets would be in the stock. And you'd pull down that lever, and as you fired, that spring there would uh, push the next bullet into the breech and be ready to fire. And, of course, numerous different types of uh, shells here. Some would explode above ground, some would explode on impact, some were hollow. This is cool. And you can just see the difference in the shells. This one to the left is a Hotchkiss shell, 
And this one to the right is from a James rifle. Wow. I have never seen this one. This one's kind of cool. This is a 2.73 inch Whitworth bolt. It's interesting. Now, in many ways, I think the Civil War is the first modern war. Um, and right here is an example of that. This is a landmine. So, this would be in the ground, and I believe that is your pressure plate. So, when an unsuspecting soldier would step on that, uh, you'd know the end result, if it worked. Good God. A hundred pound parrot shell. That is insane. And here's your eight inch grape shot. Essentially, turning your cannon into a uh, giant shotgun. Now this is something that's cool. They're showing you smoothbore versus rifled uh, cannon ordnance, as you can see. Try not to get my big melon in the way with my shadow, but a smoothbore object will be far less accurate, but obviously the projectile will be round. And for a rifled cannon, the uh, ordnance takes the shape essentially like a, a larger bullet and it would spin, making it uh, far more accurate. So like we discussed, Fort McAllister was uh, critical to the protection of Savannah. Well, when Sherman started his march to the sea in order to take Savannah and uh, be able to be resupplied by the Union Navy, he needed to attack Fort McAllister. And here's one of the quotes he would say, once uh, Union forces would take Fort McAllister, they took it, Howard. Now I've got Savannah. And here's some of the images from Fort McAllister. Now these are pretty cool, honestly. Wow, and you can just see the sheer size of uh, some of these guns here. Wow. Now here's uh, one of the sides of Fort McAllister. Here's an account from a Union soldier who assaulted Fort McAllister. The enemy's fire redoubled in rapidity and violence. On and on we moved across the open field and through their net of the baddest work. You can just see, again, we're dealing with earthworks, and they made this moat here, and they would place these stakes in the moat to create obstructions for the assaulting troops. Now, this is a pretty cool piece. This is the original flag for the Emmett Rifles, and it was made by Miss Mary Knox of Savannah, Georgia on April 3rd, 1862. And this flag was present uh, when Fort McAllister was being shelled by the Union Navy. And on December 13th, 1864, this flag would be captured by Major William Z. Clayton of the Minnesota Artillery on the assault on Fort McAllister. Wow, that's a cool piece. Now we saw those uh, big pieces of machinery that were covered from the uh, CSS Nashville. Well, here's a few more artifacts that were recovered. Wow. Now this guy here, right here, apparently that's part of a melted cannon. You can just imagine how intense a fire had to be to melt a cannon. Fort McAllister would also be the site of a major engagement in December 1864 when General Sherman went to take uh, Savannah on his march to the sea. Now, he wasn't able to take Savannah until he took this position. Um, he was in desperate need of being resupplied, and this fort stood in the way from the Union Navy being able to sail and resupply General Sherman's army. So, in order to take Savannah and complete his march to the sea, he had to take this location. And a very violent but brief uh, engagement would ensue, and it would result in a Union victory. So, Fort McAllister is just up the way, so let's uh, go check it out and see what we can learn. So something that's interesting is that's the visitor center and you have all this space and over there is Fort McAllister. Well, in between Fort McAllister and the visitor center, this is where the enlisted men would sleep. They would have two rows of tents here and these huts just over there, those are the non-commissioned officers huts and there would be up to 16 of those here. So apparently the men that were garrisoned here rarely slept inside the fort. So I just wanted to give you a closer look at the uh, huts here. And again, this would be the non-commissioned officers, sergeants, corporals, things of that nature. As you can see, you have two bunks and a little heater here. 
And again, there would be up to 16 of these. And now we're about to head into Fort McAllister. And uh, as you can see, there is a plethora of my beloved earthworks. Wow, this is awesome. So here's again, you have your main parapet and then you have your moat filled with palisades and other obstructions to uh, block infantry and cavalry. Now this moat wouldn't really be filled with water. So again, they would uh, put obstacles just to form another layer of defense. And again, as you can imagine, Union soldiers charging over open terrain, going into the moat and having to uh, scale these earthworks here, all under fire and the air is filled with hot lead. Wow, this is awesome. And here is the center of the fort. Wow. So, I don't know if you can see this again, but the different layers here. So, again, here's the center of the fort, also known as the parade. And this second layer here, this would act as a firing step. And then you have the third layer, and that's for your protection. Pretty intricate for just being dirt. And uh, these things were remarkably resilient. Again, you can uh, face heavy bombardment, and if you have the manpower, you were able to uh, quickly repair the earthworks, as opposed to a uh, stone or wooden structure, which oftentimes would shatter, crack, and collapse. So these, uh, these structures are cheap, resilient, and uh, very effective. And here's one of the gun emplacements up on uh, the walls here. You can just see the commanding view from this fortification. Again, imagine this fortification and all this would be tents. Here's your NCO huts, your commander's building, and a lot of this foliage wouldn't be here. Um, when you have a fortification like this, you want clear fields of fire. So you can just imagine when uh, General Sherman had to assault this position, a wave of Union infantry coming this way while under bombardment. And again, as you're a Confederate soldier, I'm kneeling right here, and this is me standing. So again, obviously erosion and things like that have uh, kind of flattened these out a bit, but you can just see what a simple fortification like this can do to an area. I mean, can you just imagine assaulting this position and this thing is shooting ordnance into your ranks Next thing you know, there's a hole in your line and, you know, four or five guys that were standing next to you aren't there anymore. Just couldn't imagine. So, just want to give you a closer look at this gun. Now, obviously, this isn't a one-man job. There would be several people that were tasked with uh, making sure this gun was firing and operational. And just some of the mechanisms here. So, this would obviously raise and lower your barrel. So this way and you can turn this which would turn the whole gun which would then move the gun side to side and it's hard to tell but this looks like a muzzle loader now as the war progressed uh, some cannons were able to load from the breech but this one looks like a muzzle loader wow I can look at this thing all day <laughs> so I believe I'm on the south wall uh, Fort McAllister. Again, a lot of this would have been cleared out, but just look at the imposing structure that this thing is. I mean, I keep saying it, but man, going through this trench and then you're scaling these walls. These are easily eight to 10 feet high. I know it's a little hard to see from here, but just again, you can see way over there is my fiance and she's 5'8 and is dwarfed by that mound there. Wow, such a cool place. And again, we're right on the water here. And like many fortifications of that time, uh, they guarded waterways because water was the lifeline. Water fed into your ports and your ports would uh, feed into the cities and inland from there. So if you controlled the waterways, you essentially controlled the uh, highways of that time. So you'll see a lot of these fortifications on waterways. Now I just wanted to show you one of the gun emplacements facing the water. 
and the view that this would have commanded. And I believe this is the Ogachi River. Apologize if I'm pronouncing that wrong, but uh, I believe this guy is either an eight inch or a 10 inch Columbiad. And these things could pack a punch. Again, I'm not an expert in this as much as I love them, but I believe it's an eight inch Columbiad and they were able to uh, traverse the gun side to side using these wheels here. And then uh, again, the barrel can move up and down by this wheel here. And again, you can see the view. You can imagine ships at that time wouldn't move very fast, even uh, when they're steam powered. So they would uh, definitely receive some hits coming through here. So I just wanted to clarify something. I said this was a 8 inch Columbiad. It's actually a 32 pound gun and this was designated the uh, hot shot gun. And what that means is they would heat the ball or shell and then they would fire this. And if you had a wooden warship it would uh, hopefully catch it on fire or light off the powder magazine. So we mentioned the uh, 32 pound gun that was designated the uh, hot shot gun. And this is the furnace. This is where they would uh, put the cannonballs in and heat them up in hopes of uh, catching the uh, Union ships on fire or at least hitting the powder magazine and uh, creating a big boom. Now if you were an ironclad ship, this would be uh, completely obsolete because the ball would just bounce off. But nonetheless, this is the hotshot furnace. So I'm not really sure what this room is, but uh, we can go in and check it out. And uh, it's just pretty dark. I've seen enough scary movies to know that I'm not going down a dark tunnel. So uh, yeah, it's as far as we're going. So now this room is labeled as the central bomb proof, but it was uh, used for their hospital. So there's no sign saying we can't go in. So we're gonna enter. Uh, this is pretty cool. And this room on the left, hopefully the camera's adjusting. Wow. So again, we're under one of those large mounds that you saw. And here's a few beds that would be used for not only soldiers wounded in battle, but if you were sick or had any other ailments, you'd be in here. And we're continuing down the long corridor, and I am hoping that there is no spiders. Oh, wow. Man, this is too cool. You don't think it's that big in here, but uh, man, that's at least 50 feet. And there's at least, I don't know, 20 bunks in here? That is too cool. So again, this would be the uh, makeshift hospital here and it's protected. Again, you saw the large mound we just went in and this is the uh, corridor we just went down. Man, well, that's a cool room. Now we're approaching the north side of the fort. And here's one of the magazines for the 10 inch Columbiad. Now, obviously the magazine's underground, so it's protected, but you'd also want it close to your gun emplacements so they weren't running across the fort to get more powder to return fire. So you'd often find your magazines closer to your guns. Now we're gonna go up onto uh, this gun deck here. So we're on top of the north wall here. And this is the site where Major John Galley was killed while the uh, Monitor Montauk was attacking on February 1st, 1863. The uh, 32 pound cannon that he was standing next to was struck from uh, one of the shells from the Montauk and he would die after the ensuing explosion. This is also pretty cool. Apparently, General Sherman observed the attack on Fort McAllister on December 13th, 1864 from about two and a half miles this way. Apparently there was a rice mill and he watched as uh, his forces would uh, storm the fort. Now, some of the uh, largest naval guns used against fortifications were fired on Fort McAllister in 1863. Uh, the Union ironclads were carrying 15-inch uh, guns that would fire shells and they would penetrate up to 17 feet of sand. That is absolutely insane. And they would make craters of eight feet. 
Now again, that sounds like a lot, but it, you see this last line, all the damage could be repaired overnight. Now this is something that's pretty cool. Now when the monitors bombarded Fort McAllister, apparently they were 900 to 1200 yards over there near that marsh. And uh, some of the other monitors that would attack this area, you have the Montauk, you have the Passaic, the Nahant, and the uh, Patapsco. Oof. I apologize if I'm butchering those words, but you gotta bear with me with my uh, public education here. Again, this is the Agachi River. Awesome area. Now here is one of the Columbiads that was here. And uh, I made sure that this was one and I didn't uh, steer you wrong. But man, you can just see the size of these guns. Now these guns were obviously way too big to be lugged around with the uh, infantry going from battle to battle. So these were primarily for your static fortifications. And we'll head on down into the uh, gun emplacement. And this is a replica of the uh, Coast Defense Cannon known as the Columbiad, which was manufactured in 1964 by the Savannah Machine and Foundry Company. And the Columbiad fired an 87 pound shell and its range was 2,500 yards. That is nuts. And here's one of the magazines that we're able to go into. The 32 pound rifle magazine. Oh god, spiders. And it's pretty dark, there's no lights in here. But you can see where uh, they keep the powder. Pretty well protected. And I'm not going any further, because I'm pushing my luck. Before the battle would end, Captain Nicholas Clinch was uh, called upon to surrender uh, after uh, Sherman's assault would come to an end. Well, he would uh, decline that surrender, and after he was stabbed three times by a saber, six times by a bayonet, and received two gunshot wounds, he was finally taken prisoner. Huh, is that all? And just going into detail about the assault on December 13th, General B. Hazen's division of the 15th Corps started their attack on December 13th at 4.45. And after a brief but intense uh, battle of 15 minutes, the fort was taken by five o'clock. And here's some of the casualties here. The Union would suffer 24 killed and have over 110 wounded. And the Confederates had 14 killed and 21 wounded. And 195 were captured. So pretty staggering numbers from a 15 minute engagement. And here's just a reminder that uh, landmines and torpedoes are uh, pretty prevalent and were uh, responsible for most of the Union casualties who assaulted from the west which is that direction, over towards the visitor center. And General Sherman personally gave orders that the captured Confederates of the uh, garrison here be required to remove the uh, unexploded mines. So now we're making our way from Fort McAllister to the mortar battery, which is about 75 to 100 yards southeast of the fort. Coming up on the uh, mortar emplacement there, and back that way is Fort McAllister, down this trail. And here's the 10 inch mortar emplacement. And you can't really see because of the foliage, but the river's that way. Huh, pretty cool. The big difference between mortars and traditional artillery is mortars would fire a more vertical trajectory. Um, they were good for shooting over walls and over other fortifications. And traditional artillery had a lower trajectory. So we're making our way on the east side of the fort. Now, this part is important because during the final assault by Sherman's infantry, several regiments would uh, brave heavy enemy fire and come around to the east side of the wall here and bypass a lot of the Confederate fortifications. And uh, both sides and both commanders would account that the uh, 47th Ohio was the first unit to breach the walls and place their flag 
inside Fort McAllister. And once all the Union troops started scaling the walls, the Confederate defenders retreated into that bomb proof that we went into, that it was used as a hospital. And after some brief negotiation, they would all come out and be prisoner. And again, we're on the east side still, and this is the route that the 47th Ohio would take around the fort. And apparently there was a gap in these fortifications where there was no palisades and they were able to scale the walls under heavy fire and take Fort McAllister. Man, so I almost missed this. Now this is a piece of a rail line and this is an example of uh, Sherman's necktie. And I don't think there were any rail lines near here. I think this is just an example, but uh, his uh, forces on their march to the sea would take these, heat them up and bend them around trees and uh, render the uh, railway useless. That's pretty cool to see. I've never seen one up close like this. This was uh, a really cool experience. I learned a lot up until a couple weeks ago. Had no idea about this place, but apparently it played a uh, pretty pivotal role in the defense of Savannah. And uh, it was one of three fortifications that uh, defended Savannah. And as you know by now, I love these earthworks. <laughs> So simple and effective, and here they are, 150 years later. Hope you enjoyed this one, and uh, we'll catch you on the next one.